All right, guys, time to talk another masterpiece, which has been a little bit. And the f Jesus Christ! I had to throw something in here because there's going to be no humor in this fucking video. Those puppets will fucking creep up on you anytime. But I knew well before I started this channel that there was going to be two types of videos that I would do on here. And one is going to be the more common one which is just, I inject a lot of humor and picking shit apart and stupid observations and stuff. And mostly with probably 90% of the films that I'll, I talk about on here in the past and that I'll continue to well into the future. Probably around there, 90%. And then there's that special 10% that's just near masterpieces or masterpieces or perfect films, which I've said on here many times, you won't hear me refer to a film as perfect more than a handful of times, maybe, maybe two handfuls at the most, at the very most. This isn't a perfect film. This is, this is a fucking near masterpiece. This is Mario Bava's 1966 gothic ghost story, Kill Baby Kill. And this is only two years after A Bay of Blood. Well, not A Bay of Blood, fucking uh, Blood and Black Lace. Which, just the lighting in that movie and the use of color is fucking phenomenal. And obviously was a huge influence on Dario Argento. Same with this movie. Like, I'm pretty sure if I recall correctly, Argento has referenced this movie as being a huge influence on Suspiria. And you can see it, man, like all over the place. But Bava, I always kind of have to be in a certain mood to watch Bava. And yeah, I have the lights dimmed and shit because this is one fucking atmospheric, creepy fucking movie. And it's so well done. So I'm setting the mood here. We're getting, getting nice and settled into the gothic, creepy ghost atmosphere. But I have to be in a... A certain mood to watch Baba. N this has nothing to do with that I think he's a fucking master. Like, one of the greatest directors, like, in my top ten. Same with Argento, same with Fulci. But Fulci, I can watch pretty much whenever. And Argento, I can watch whenever the fuck. Like, if he can, Argento can be on my screen whenever he wants, basically. But it takes, like, a certain mood for me to throw a Bava film on. But man, when I'm in that mood and I get to watch a rewatch a Bava film, it's fucking sublime, man. It's so good. And just the fucking atmosphere in this movie is it's fucking amazing. Like it is it is dripping with atmosphere. This film is so fucking hauntingly atmospheric that I consider this one of the greatest ghost films ever. Like, of all time. Like, just between so many things I'm going to talk about here. So strap in. This is going to be a fucking uh, decently long video. But just, oh god, the atmosphere of this movie is just stunning. And then just the gothic tone and feel here is so effective. And just Bava is so stylistic. Like, with every movie that he makes. Like, and I always cite A Bay of Blood. That's probably why I said that instead of Blood and Black Lace. As my favorite Bava film. And a lot of that has to do with that I've, I've said. I've, this is the second Bava film I've covered on this channel. Which is a fucking crime. Like, 200 films in the last five months that I've covered. But... A Bay of Blood I always consider. And I hate that fucking name. Twitch of the Death Nerf. The, one of the greatest names for a fucking horror movie ever. Like, I, I do not like A Bay of Blood. It's always Twitch of the Death Nerve. Will always be better than that. But I always cite that as, in my opinion, and I know a lot of people agree with this, as the most influential film in leading to and shaping and molding this, the slasher genre. Well before Halloween and Black Christmas and all that, we had Twitch of the Death Nerve. Blood and Black Lace is considered by most people to be one of, one of, if not the giallo that kicked off the whole giallo craze in Italy. 
when Bird with the Crystal Plumage by Argento came out, that's kind of when it exploded. But with Blood and Black Lace is cited by so many people as like the first Giallo. So you, this fucking director has started like the Giallo genre, started the fucking slasher genre. Like it's unreal what this guy has done in his career. And different from Argento and Fulci, where a little few decades into their career when they just started going on a downward slope. Unfortunately, Bava never. Like, Bava's had a steady, amazing, fucking mesmerizing career throughout his entire career. Like, I can't think of a Bava film I don't love. Off the top of my head. I really can't. So just from beginning to end, this guy has just been a fucking master at directing. And I'm just going to blanket that instead of talking about it throughout the video because his directing is just fucking masterful. So blanket that all over this because I'm not going to mention it again because I'll be saying it over and over and over again. But this was his return to gothic horror and stuff. We had Black Sunday and then we had Black Sabbath, which is another film that I, this is a film that I watch every October, Kill Baby Kill, and Black Sunday. Not Black Sunday, Black Sabbath. So confusing with the two fucking names of those. But Black Sabbath and Kill Baby Kill are both bother films that I watch every October. And I knew I was going to be doing this, uh, covering this movie. I just didn't know in the next few days when I wanted to do it. And then I just got in that mood like a few hours ago. And I said, all right, like that's it. And like I decided on it earlier today. And I said, I'll see if I get into that mood later tonight which later tonight for me was like 12 hours later because it's fucking almost four in the morning. Perfect time to to fucking watch this movie though. It was like three in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. And just everything about this movie is just near perfect. And the score in this, even though the score in this was mostly stock music and like music that was used in there's some of the score in here was used in Blood and Black Lace and stuff. There's not an original score here. But the music, the main theme here of the, just like the childlike lullaby that plays is so fucking effective. Like, it's so good. It's so creepy. It adds even more to the atmosphere, more to the gothic tone and feel of this movie. It's absolutely fucking stunning. And I just got to talk about the fucking lighting. Like... Argento is a master. Don't get me wrong with lighting. Like, if you see my Suspiria video or any of the videos I did on all of Argento's films from the 70s to the 90s, like early 90s, praise the shit out of him always. Especially with Suspiria, Inferno, and just with his real colorful films. But Bava is just on another level. Like, to the point that I don't even know how he does it. Like, I'm not a cinematographer. I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm not big into like lighting and shit in film. I don't know like how they work that, like <laughs> for the most part, besides from just watching the, watching film. But God, the fucking color and lighting in this movie, like you, in almost every shot, like almost every scene, there's, over here will be like a blue color and then over over here is yellow and then green over here and it's just the colors are all separate but they all just blend together so fucking perfectly and it's like i don't know how he does it like do they just have colored lights that they shine at different fucking parts of the scene i'm guessing that's that's how they do it but just think of the work that that takes for an entire film and a lot of this movie, it's it's been debated actually, but Bava has said that this was mostly improvised, this movie. And then critics and stuff and people who like always like look into Bava's career and reappraise his career and stuff pretty much kind of deny that and say that it was like heavily scripted and stuff. So and it feels like it's really scripted. It doesn't feel like it's it's improvised that much. So I don't know if that was just Baba just just bullshitting. Like <laughs> I don't know. But just even if it was, that makes it even more unreal. That this is 
that the possibility that this film was heavily improvised. But I don't think it was. Like, I really don't. And then just the sets in this, every fucking set looks fantastic. And just the fog and the spider webs, cobwebs everywhere, and the gothic statues and shit. It, it's fucking unbelievable what he did with this movie. And I, my, my mind is going to keep going all over the place. So if I, you should know that by now, people who watch. But when I mentioned Twitch of the Death Nerve, Bay of Blood earlier, as I cite that as usually my favorite Baba film. I think that has a lot to do with, like, slasher films are my favorite subgenre of horror, which I say all the time. So I, usually that's probably why I always cite it as that. But when I really think about it, it's pretty much a three-way tie between Twitch of the Death Nerve, this movie, and uh, Lisa and the Devil. Which, what a fucking masterpiece that movie is, man. I can't wait to talk about that shit. But, oh, the fuck, just everything about this movie. And, and the acting's great, too. Like, everyone does phenomenal in this. For a film from in Italy from 1966, it still holds up amazingly. It really does. But just everything, the directing, the cinematography, the sets, the atmosphere, the tone and feel of it, the lighting, the coloring, the editing, the, some, the, the camera shots, and, and, and everything is fucking unreal with this movie. So let's actually dive into the fucking movie now. <laughs> I told you, strap in, we're at 11 minutes. This is going to be a while. And then we have Irina, who ends up running away from the Villa Graps, which is where this Baroness lives in this... I forget where it is. I don't even think they say. It's like in Central Europe somewhere in the mountains, and it's in the early 1900s, which we find out later when we see... Um, Melissa, the um, ghost girl who haunts this village, when we see her uh, coffin in the tomb, it says that she died in, in 1887. And then they mention that it was 20 years ago. So it's 1907 here in, in this film. So we see Irina running and screaming like a mad woman as we hear spirits moaning. And then she climbs up into her, like, I don't know if it's her house or something, but she's standing on a platform and she's looking down at a... Uh, a fence with like sharp fence posts and stuff on top of it and just we don't know at first but it seems like she was either pushed or she fell or something like that and she falls onto the fence post and impales through her body and then we just get the title kill baby kill on the screen and the credits go through that with just the still shot on the body on the fence during the whole credits which is Fucking awesome. Like, I love that so much. Just focusing on that image during the whole credit sequence is so good. And we have Dr. Paul Irway, who ends up coming to this town in horse and carriage to do an autopsy on Irina's body to find out if it was foul play or if it was an accident. And just the shot of the men like carrying the coffin in the distance when they first show when he first shows up in the horse and carriage such a great fucking shot like there are so many shots in this film that are absolutely amazing that it, this movie is just like a cinematic marvel whenever i watch it which is like i said like every fucking october absolutely and it never ceases to blow me away every single time every time i watch this film same with Lisa and the Devil, same with Bay of Blood, same with Blood and Black Lace, same with Black Sunday, same with, like, every fucking Baba film, pretty much. It just blows me away every time I watch it. This guy was, oh my god, what a fucking master. And we have his son, Lamberto Baba, who was assistant director on this and obviously went on to have a great career of his own, which, with some classic amazing movies, which I can't wait to discuss in the future also. And then just just how desolate and barren and gothic the town looks. This little village. I can't even call it a town. It's like a, a village, basically. Just, again, the sets, it, they look phenomenal. And the lighting and colors everywhere, which is different colors all over the place. Like, every scene looks like that. Every scene's presented that way, shot that way. And it just looks so fucking good. It's so eerie. 
this film is so eerie. It's so creepy. And then let's just talk about Melissa for a second. The little ghost girl here, which Baba looked for hundreds of young girls to play Melissa in this movie. Seven years old, the ghost of Melissa in this movie. And he couldn't find one. The fact that a young boy played Melissa in this is unreal too. Like, I didn't know that when I first saw this movie years ago. I had no idea that was a, that was a young boy playing the role of Melissa. And honestly, like, to this day, I think that Melissa Grapps is one of, one of, if not the creepiest, terrifying fucking ghosts in a, in a horror film. Like, ever. And it's not like, and this is why it pisses me off when I watch, like, modern movies and stuff. It's been the last few decades. The Conjuring movies and Insidious. And, and don't get me wrong, I enjoy those films. And, like, all those types of movies and stuff. All the ghost films and everything which obviously goes the CGI route so many times with effects and stuff like that. It just never looks as good. It never looks, the ghosts never look as creepy, never look as effective, never looked as eerie, never look as terrifying as the ghosts of Melissa in this movie. And it's just a, a young boy with a blonde wig and maybe like makeup to make him look pale, to make her look pale. That's it. There were no other effects on the on, on this person's face, on this kid's face, at all. And just the fact that that's all it took to make this ghost look fucking terrifying every time that you see her in this movie is just, it's, that's an absolute marvel to me. That's unbelievable. Kind of how I always say with demon movies. I don't think I've ever even mentioned it on the channel, but... With The Exorcist, with the effects of, with Reagan in The Exorcist, with her with her eyes rolling back and the white eyes and the throat bulging out and all the effects on Reagan in The Exorcist had never been rivaled for me in a, in a demonic movie, a demonic possession movie, like ever. And it's just, it's, it's so fascinating to think about that. This, this movie is from 1966. Fucking almost half a century ago. More than that. Right? I don't know. I'm not doing math at four in the morning. But fucking all this all these decades later, just the sim the simplisticness of the effects on her, which like I said, there's like none. And not being able to be still so effective all these decades later. When we've had such a big growth in you know technology and in effects work and makeup effects and all of that and nothing comes close to like the ghost in this movie and the same thing with reagan and the exorcist of all the advancements we've had in practical effects and makeup effects and everything like that nothing has come close to reagan in, in the exorcist with the effects on her and i just think that's absolutely that's so interesting that something that can be made so long ago so cheaply compared to 95% of the horror films that are made since then can't capture how effective that these characters and stuff are in these films like it's absolutely stunning and then Dr. Uh, Sway Paul he ends up meeting with um, Inspector Kruger to do the autopsy and um, let me see here. My notes are all over the place for this. That's right. And then Irina, we find out, was made at the uh, Villa Graps, which is, like I said, this, like, central Gothic building in here that the Baroness Graps lives in, who we find out later is a medium, and is basically who's Melissa's ghost is basically, like, using to curse the villagers and stuff in this village and just the shot of melissa swinging on the swing and how the camera just goes forward and back like that and her giggle man 
Like, just <laughs> her giggle and laughter in this movie, again, is so effective. It's so creepy. It's so unsettling that nothing is, is top fit for me. Like, like, I can't think of something at the moment. Again, it's only like four in the morning. So, But I really can't. Like, every time, every year I watch this movie and I just say the same thing. Like, just the look of her, the fucking, her laughter, the shots of her, everything. One of, if not the best ghosts in, in a horror movie for me. And I gotta stop, uh, I gotta fucking move this along because <laughs> this is gonna fucking go on and on, man. And then we have Monica who's a medical assistant who witnesses the autopsy and we find out that there's a silver coin in Irina's heart and we find out that the whole town is so superstitious with everything going on with Melissa's ghost and that we find out later that there's been like 10 deaths of all perfectly young healthy people like rational people like that would not kill themselves or harm themselves in any way all have died from being cursed and marked for death by Melissa's ghost. And they have this whole, because of the superstition, they end up putting these silver coins, a silver coin in the heart of everyone who dies in this town as like a talisman for them to be buried and then not have their ghosts come back and haunt the town. It's such a great fucking story, man. Like, the just the story alone and the script is fucking phenomenal in this. Like, it's so good. And this was, like, not a big production for Baba. Like, when he first started doing this movie, it was supposed to be a much, like, lower budget. And it is low budget. But, like, it was... It turned kind of into a bigger film than it was ever meant to be. Like, this is supposed to be, like, a smaller scale project for him. And ended up just turning into one of, in my opinion, his, his fucking masterpieces. Which, like I said, most of his movies are near masterpieces. And we have a cat in here. No no cat scare. That's why I fucking love you, Baba. Fucking, see, you don't need to have fucking cat jump, stare, jump scares in a fucking movie. And Baba knew that back then. People would just watch more fucking Mario Baba films... We wouldn't have the insane amount of millions of cat jump scares, which I don't even call them that anymore. And people who watch, you know what they are now. They're not fucking cat jump scares anymore. I solved that issue and I'm working on the uh, friend, uh, innocent person creeps up on someone, scares the shit out of them jump scare as a way to fix that shit. And that's coming. Still racking my brain on that. But you just hear a cat. And it fucking walks down the alley. And fucking Paul turns around and looks at it. That's it. There's no jump scare. Nothing. And there are like two or three jump scares in this movie. If you can really even call it that. Like in the way that we refer to a jump scare today. Today a jump scare is just with the loud fucking music. And then down. And fucking oh shit. Not like that at all. It's done so well. That's the type of jump scare that I would love to see in so many more movies nowadays. And we really don't get that. Man. It, it's a fucking shame. And then Paul's attacked by two of the peasants and Ruth, who's the town witch, sorceress, whatever you want to call her, intervenes. And then we get the first shot of Melissa when she's visiting Nadine, who's a, a daughter of one of the locals in the village. And... She's pretty much marked for death. But the first shot of Melissa that we get at the window and stuff. Don't tell me my camera's stuttering. Working again? I'm not recording. This is even still recording, so.